So this past Monday uh, in St. Paul, there was a large procession of over 5,000 people beginning at one end of Summit Avenue and concluding at the other, beginning more or less at the Mississippi River where the seminary is on St. Thomas campus and ending at the cathedral. It was a procession led by the Eucharist and the Monstrance. I was out of town and wasn't able to go, but some of the parishioners who went spoke to me of how powerful it was. Like, first of all, just the witness to our faith, that the Lord's worth that and a lot more. But then also just what it conveyed to them that Jesus truly does walk with us in all of life. We can count on him. He will never fail us. He's faithful. Now this procession is part of a larger, years-long, actually, National Eucharistic Revival. The whole goal of our shepherds, the bishops of this country, is that more and more Catholics would come awake again fully to the beautiful truth of the Lord's body and blood. It does sort of begin with an understanding of who this person is who comes to us. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. Not a symbol. It really is him. And hopefully then that understanding would lead towards greater reverence, greater wonder, greater fruits of knowing how to live through him, with him, and in him. Now I would say, my experience here at St. Ambrose is our Eucharistic revival was a gift given to us that began five years ago. More or less when the pandemic started and everything else went away. There were no events, there were no meetings, there were no coordinated works of mercy. There was, everything was stripped except one thing, the Eucharist. We had the Eucharist and so we found a way. <laughs> those beautiful parking lot masses that left this impression on us, giving communion to people driving through on Christmas morning even though my fingers were frozen because it was below zero. And I remember in the very first week, we had to put the tabernacle here in the sanctuary basically just because we needed more space, you know, it was all social distancing. And I wanted the doors of this church to be open but I can't tell you the number of parishioners who came to me after that and said, you're not gonna move the tabernacle, are you? <laughs> it just makes so much sense that Jesus' real presence is in the center. You know, it was after this that the inspiration to have a chapel with the Lord's presence, real presence, was initiated. And I'll tell you, each day the Lord is working miracles in that chapel with people who come to him with open, trusting hearts. He's healing, he's inspiring, he's consoling, he's giving mercy and love that's making hearts new. There are so many fruits to this turn, this clear turn the Lord did for us that I could go on and on. The number of people who stepped forward to bring communion to others who can't be with us because of health, Stephen ministry. There's so many things. And what is the essence of this Eucharistic revival for St. Ambrose? It's that we learn how to live towards Jesus with our need and our hunger and our thirst and our desire. And then we learn to live from him. His presence that's compassionate and consoling and to live from his strength. You know, I think sometimes if we can accomplish the first thing, which is beautiful to realize we are not dealing here with a symbol, but the actual flesh and blood of our Savior, his beating heart that comes to live with our beating heart, that sometimes we can think that it's a static presence. 
You know, it's just a static presence. Well, if it's a real presence, like yours is a real presence, it's an active and engaging presence. That actually when we allow Jesus to live with us, to share our life, to live in us, He abides in us and we abide in Him, then we can expect gradually over time this transformation. So today I want to hold up to what I consider something of like a Eucharistic spirituality. And it's right here in the Gospel. What did Jesus do right before he took that bread? And basically the literal translation is, this thing here is my body. What did he do? There were four verbs. There's an activity happening. And I want to propose that what he did there was what he wants to do in each of our hearts and souls. He took bread. He said the blessing, he broke it, and gave it. What would it be like for you and I to live with this deep understanding that we are taken by Jesus? And I think there's a nuance of meaning. I am so taken by the beauty and majesty and goodness of Jesus. I'm taken. I could care less if the twins win today. <laughs> That doesn't take me. I'm taken by him. And then I want to propose a little deeper level with just a story, if I'm getting this right, that my dad used to tell. But when he was in medical school at the University of Minnesota in the 1970s, predominantly the physicians, the doctors were men and the nurses were women. And there was a little nurse's station where they could go get something to eat. And I think there was a poster of all the interns. And then the nurses over time would make little notes by the pictures of these physicians, like drives a really nice car, handsome, kind, whatever. And next to my dad was written four kids. Because at that time I was already born and there were those four children and my dad living and mom living in a two bedroom apartment. But it's kind of a badge of honor yeah, it's known that I belong to my wife, whom I love. And I wonder if you and I can start to think of ourselves as taken by Jesus. The sense that I belong to him, he belongs to me. I, I'm not only not ashamed of that, I, I love that that's known in spite of my imperfection. He took bread and he blessed it. What would it be like to live from the blessing of Jesus? You know, I get on a plane, this is the third year in a row once we uh, graduate all of our students and get them out for the summer. The Lord's called me to lead a silent retreat for 20, 25 missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa's group in D.C. So I'll be with them, and on Thursday I was talking to the sort of superior and, you know, planning things. And, and they often do this when they're on the phone. I think always they'll say, before you hang up, Father, give me your blessing. <laughs> They like pull my priestly blessing out of me, you know? So there I am giving Sister Marcella a blessing from Woodbury all the way to the Bronx, you know? Do you know the other time Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it? It was when he multiplied the loaves. I think if you and I live from our poverty towards God, we will experience our energy multiplied, our gifts expansive. Like we won't live so stingy of lives. We'll just, I'm in his blessing. And to be honest, it can be scary at times. You can feel like you're on deep water like Peter. And then we just got to keep our eyes on him. Third, this might be the hardest of the verbs of what Jesus wants to do and mold with his active presence when we receive him with humility. What does it mean to be broken? I want to propose that the thing that most gets in the way of our spiritual growth is self-reliance. We think we got to be strong. We got to be perfect. I need to do it. It's really so connected to the fiction, the fiction, the illusion of control. 
Like the whole spiritual life, relationship with God, is based on this trust and surrender. And sometimes I think like, okay, Lord, I'll take it from here. Thanks for your help. (laughs) To be broken, to be vulnerable. You know, I think the people in your life who are most need, needing your love, receive more from your weakness and vulnerability when you live it in trust with God than your strengths. I really believe that. Sometimes our strengths are just ways of living in our own measure. Do you remember the woman right before what happened at the Last Supper? The woman who broke open the alabaster jar of ointment and anointed Jesus. Judas said, why, what a waste. Why'd you break that open? And the fathers of the church has always understood, like it's good to fail at times. It's good to not have the strength, to not have the energy. Because then we truly are outside of the illusion of how much we do need God. And then he can meet an open heart. He took bread. He wants to take you. Are you taken by him? He wants to bless you. He wants to anoint every part of your body, your heart, your soul. You know, he wants, it's okay. He wants to meet you where you're broken. And fourth, he gave the bread. And he wants you and me to live lives that are given. You know, sometimes I get it, I get it. I I imagine that maybe when I'm 75, I'll have a nice little cabin by a quiet lake. You know, it's fun to dream of that. But the reality is, even people coming up to retirement, yeah, life does change. That's great that you get to lay down the burden of a job that maybe you liked, maybe you didn't. You get to lay down certain responsibilities. But sometimes people talk about it of like, I'm just going to build barns, I'm going to eat, drink, be merry. And I'm like, you're not going to be happy. Our whole life is made for gift. Like, how do you give yourself in retirement? The form changes, but unless you're giving, you're not happy. We don't know us ourselves apart from giving our lives. Do you know when I have the privilege of being with people as they near the final moments? Do you know what you often have to walk with them through? Because it's mercy. It's all mercy. Is some sense of regret that they didn't give enough to those who needed them. Do you remember Schindler's List? Do you remember how much Schindler does for the Jews? And you know, he's weeping at the end. I could have done more. I could have saved more. No one ever says at the end of their life, I gave too much. (laughs) Yes, when you live a life of gift, you will get hurt. You will. It means you're vulnerable. You're giving. And you'll be disappointed. You'll be hurt. But then, then we just need to give forgiveness. Just something else to give. Mercy. People of St. Ambrose, I just think the Lord's doing something so beautiful because something was clarified from us and there's no going back. I actually think a lot of the things that were washed away, it was like Noah's flood. There's no need for some of those things to come back. Maybe some of them just got in the way of this clear, simple, direct path to Jesus with our thirst, desire, and need and learning to live through him, with him, and in him. His compassion, his energy in us, his strength, his mercy when we fall. So today we ask for that grace. We ask for the grace just to like, Lord, without you I can do nothing. But through you, with you, and in you, all things are possible.